have been an entrepreneur in oil and gas uh, with some of the worst timing. Uh, we rose like a rocket ship and sunk like a rock Roman candle. Um, I've done real estate, which I'm still currently involved in, uh, multifamily for the most part. And uh, that's more of my passion is the real estate side. Um, I've also done a little bit on media uh, as an investor and as somebody who helped with back end side for um, the creation of a movie. So I enjoy some of those artistic pursuits, some of those investments. I really love actually the ideation and creation of business. Uh, currently, I work for a large um, billion dollar GC, general contractor, operates in multiple states. Um, and I'm the director of business development for the Gulf States region. Well, welcome okay. and thank You're you so wrong. much for joining us, man. It looks like you got your, uh, sounds like you got your plate full, brother. So um, not to mention Matt Nalen is a United States Marine Corps veteran. He is right. involved with our community. He is involved with a, a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, we could do a whole freaking segment on what Matt does, but uh, okay. thank you for joining us. Uh, I think you have a lot to bring to the table today. Uh, thank you guys on Facebook World out there for uh, joining us. You know, we always kick this off by saying we appreciate you guys. You have a lot to bring to the table today. Uh, thank you guys on Facebook. We are on week 14. So, Doc, you were right, man. So we've, been, uh, nice. we've been moving and grooving. So, uh, we want to highlight a veteran-owned RVBA member uh, business today. And our boy, Scott Pell, who owns 316 Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, he's a Army veteran. Uh, Doc, if you can tag him in the comments for us right there real quick, brother. Um, Army Special Forces was a police officer. But if you're looking to take your child to uh, somewhere they can learn martial arts, discipline, integrity, uh, some real good morals, this is a, a, uh, a, great, a great guy who really puts – his beliefs in religion and his, you know, history and his background and teaches your children and even uh, old fellas like Matt over there get in there and get twisted up. So Scott, we appreciate you being a member of the RBBA brother. We wish you well. Hope business stays great. If you guys need anything from him, uh, look up 316 BJJ on Facebook. We'll post it real quick here. And then without further ado, uh, just we'll as a start. side note, as a, as a little bit of a, yeah, as an additional commercial forum, all three of my kids are in there. It's a big part of our lives. Um, you know, sometimes anybody who has kids knows that having that additional adult reinforcement about manners, about discipline, about picking yourself up when, listen, you get humbled in there any day and you got to keep after it and being resilient. So that 316 BJJ is a big part of our lives. So I'm, I'm very grateful that they're here in town. All right, let's just tag him real quick here in this. Even if you're inconsistent like me and you, you get, you know, a rash of shit when you come in and they're like, hey, where you been? <laughs> <laughs> hey, but that's a good, that's you're, a good part about Your it. kids have been here, but you haven't. Yeah. Hey, the other yeah, thing my too kids is don't Scott, work. <laughs> Scott also runs a uh, organization outside of 316 Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu that's a veteran extreme. So if you know of any veterans that have been wounded in action. Uh, I'll give you an example. This week, he took a paraplegic uh, service member, missing an arm, missing both legs, and took him and his children on a fishing trip. And man, if you can look that up and see the see the excitement and the love in that guy's face, which by catching fish with his children, it changes people's lives. So with that being said, awesome, there it is right there. So. We have decided for the month of July that we are going to do Superhero Month. And uh, our leadership team sat down and we came up with five different uh, heroes, I guess you would call them, or some of them, or what do you call the bad heroes? Uh, villains. Uh, yeah, the villains. the villains. So, you know, we're going to hit some topics that are surrounded by a few of these people. And today, we're going to be talking about B Lego Batman, which is, which is uh, if you've seen the movie Lego Batman, he tries to be great but falls short. But the one thing that he does do is he tries to emulate some some greatness that he finds. So this whole topic today is about emulating the great. And the difference between emulating and imitating is something that we're going to cover here. We're going to cover some action items, some things we want you to take away from this. And then we're going to cover a very, very successful uh, businessman and how he got there. 
And then we're going to tell you what to do uh, when you want to, basically what kind of person you want to be so other people want to emulate you. So without, uh, I guess the first thing we'll do is I'll just read off a couple of notes here that I have. So the difference in imitate versus emulate to emulate is to try and be as good or successful as to imitate is to copy or fashion oneself. So doc, with that being said, what did you take away from emulate versus imit imitate? Well, like you said, um, a lot of people like to imitate others, right? And, and I found out when I first started my own business, I, I wanted to be like the other companies right? But what I fell short, it was, is I never uh, created my own brand. I never was ever be able to separate myself from my competition. And that's where I really think the distinguish comes from emulating somebody and imitating. If you're going to imitate somebody, then just don't do it at all. Otherwise, you're kind of faking the funk, in my opinion. So, but there's nothing wrong with emulating a successful company. There are tons of successful roofing companies out there that, that work on integrity, they do the, right, the work right the first time, they don't cut corners. And those are the type of companies that I want to be like, the ones that I want to grow my company like. And so if I'm seeing that they're doing it this way, then that's the way I want to do it also. You yeah. know, but if you're just out there faking the funk and buying the knockoff Jordans and you're figuring out why your, your shoe <laughs> fell apart three weeks later, it's because yeah. you're freaking cutting corners. And to me, that's the biggest difference between imitating and emulating. If you imitate, you're cutting corners. Yeah. Because when you emulate success, it's hard. It is hard work to be able to walk that fine line, to be able to tell your friend, your family, no, I'm not going to be able to do that because it doesn't stick with our mission, vision, values. And that's the key difference between imitating someone and emulating success. Well, and one thing is you can't really copy originality or personality, right? So, I mean, each one of us on the screen today have our own us, you know, I'm me, Matt's him, Doc's you, Casey's you. Um, if you're imitating your competitor, for example, you're taking what that competitor does and you're making it cheaper, really is what you're doing. That's right. Uh, and you're, using, you're, uh, you're saying you're, you're knockoff, that, that's exactly what that is. So when you emulate something, you're taking that and you're taking that to the next step, rather you're it's taking what they do to the next level using your own strengths. So mm -hmm. emulation is personalized. With that being said, Matt, give us some input on emulation and maybe some, some of the ways that you have emulated, you know, being an entrepreneur and kind of working your way through a bunch of different areas. And then obviously being a, a, a very high up leader in a corporate company. Give us your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, Doc kind of nailed it. I mean, when you're imitating, what you're really doing is you're just you're just copying somebody else. And typically it's derivative and typically you don't have the ability to think originally and for yourself. And so uh, I think it's a cheaper version. When you emulate, a lot of times what you're also doing is you're compiling from different sources. It's not just one person that you're emulating. You're emulating a kind of a wide variety of people that you find inspiring and yeah. that you think have trailblazed before you and that you want to try and um, chart that same path because you, you've seen it done successfully, but with your own style, like what Doc was saying, with your own mission values. Um, yeah. You know, for me on, uh, on the emulation side, I, I, my father has been an entrepreneur his whole life uh, and he's been an entrepreneur in real estate. And I think that's one of the guiding guide stars that I've always had. I mean, I've been able to step out on a lot of different occasions and take risks because I've seen him do it. So yeah. to me, that's emulated. I've seen him where he's done well. I've seen him where he's done poorly. I know I knew from a very young age how hard being an entrepreneur was because I got to watch my father and that was emulated. Yeah. I tried not to imitate him on many different yeah. <laughs> you know, occasions because I've seen where some of those pitfalls have been. But I've also witnessed where he's been successful. And again, just like every entrepreneur, you can be high, you can be low. So I I would say in many ways the person I emulate is my dad on the entrepreneurial side. And really that's about problem solving. 
So you've kind of taken his value. Go ahead. You kind of took what you saw from his ups and downs and pitfalls, and you kind of put your own twist on it, which is kind of something I think we all do. You know, we we continually talk about uh, our circle here. You know what I mean? And, and it's not a closed circle. We have an open circle. And but when we talk about our circle, we're talking about surrounding ourselves with people that are better than us, people that are more successful than us. You know, if you want to be a level ten there's no reason why you're hanging around with level twos. Right. So yeah. I'm not saying, you know, we're not looking down upon anybody when we say those type of things, but um, you know, one thing you could do, and this is an action item as we're kind of following along our script here is to write down five character traits you admire most in your personal heroes. That could be a sports figure. That could be a businessman. That could be an entrepreneur. That could be uh, your family. You know, Matt, you use your father as an example. That that's fantastic. So once you figure out, and I didn't even live with him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So from but he must have he must have been impactful though, because you obviously, you know, some of the fibers that he had transferred to you. So what we want to try to do is we want to find somebody to emulate, and I'm going to bring up a um, a person here in just a second. But you want to get yourself a list of traits to emulate in your own life, and that could be different types of uniqueness uniqueness. Um, you put your own spin on it, but you want to figure out their mindset, their attitudes and their behaviors, which have helped them to achieve that success and also strategies and tactics. So we'll go back here, but a little bit, I want to bring up a man by the name of Sam Walton, um, born March 29th, 1918. So that's, I, I'm not a very big history buff, but that's great depression era. I think boys. Not yet. Not yet. Too 1918 early. was World War One. Yeah. Okay, so World War One, right? So he founded a company which we all know and love. We all go there, and we also have some cool memes from this place uh, called Walmart. So in 1962, fun people watching. That's it. Yeah. So 1962, he created Walmart. By the time 1990 hit, which is 28 years into his business, he had built the largest retail sales chain in the United States. You got to understand here when we're talking about emulate the great people will respect genuine. They are going to, they're going to read right through the bullshit. That's the bottom line to it. You know, if you hang out with the right people, they're going to read right through it. So some key points that we can take away from Sam here, and you guys want to go down these, there's four of them. There's four of us and we can kind of chat a little bit about it. Casey, do you have the script in front of you, man? Okay. We're going to keep moving. So in 28 years, this man found a way to build the biggest retail business here. So the first thing we want to talk about, we want to emulate. Hey, you got a lot of noise in that. Hey, so you may have to mute, brother. So always make sorry, guys. that's all right. Always make your customers happier and happier with your product and service. Doc, I'd like you to speak on this one. Man, that's tough when you deal with homeowners. You know that you've been in that industry dealing with the homeowner. Yeah. Customer service is key, trying to go above and beyond, and especially in dealing with such a high competitive uh, industry as as the roofing. Um, being able to maintain that that customer service level um, can be pretty tiresome. Right. But it's what I pride myself on. Right. And that's what continues to create that word of mouth buzz and give up and be able to do what we need to do to become successful. You know what I'm saying? So I think it's important that we continue to strive for that customer well, service and retention. Speak on something more specific here and keeping your customers happier and happier with your products and service. Sam Walton was a big key of making people not just happy, but happier that they visited Walmart. So, you know, there's there's a thing where so clients are happy, you. right? Happier yeah. is when they start telling other people about you. So, you, you know, building on small improvements on a weekly basis allows you to pass on those happier moments to your clients. So and I'll give you a prime example, yeah, right? Shoot. So a lot of times when, when home builders start out in a subdivision, they use a lower grade shingle, right? Mm -hmm. We call those a three tab shingle. 
but whenever I get involved and they've had a, and they're in the storm restoration process, I often upgrade them to a superior product. And that's kind of the same uh, concept that Sam was going for. Instead of buying the, the knockoff brand, he said, you know what, I'm going to create a better brand and he called it great value. Right. And yeah. so that's what we do to make that kick client go from happy to happier. Yeah. Right. I'm giving them a better product, a longer lasting material. We go from uh, a, what I feel is a crummier felt paper. I know a lot of the, the stuff that I'm saying may be a little great to the people listening, but it's very, very important to my customer when they're having their, their roof replaced, mm -hmm. right? Because I'll go from a, a, a simple felt paper to a synthetic felt paper, which has so many more advantages to it. And so if I understand you correctly, that's kind of where um, we kind of excel ourselves in making the our client go from happy to happier, which is going to say, you know what, you need to call a doc. This dude goes above and beyond. And what the other great thing we do is I don't pass that cost back on to the, to the homeowner, right? Like, because we can fit it within their, their budget to make them better because we all know what the true cost at, on a wholesale versus retail. And that's what Sam did. He passed those cost savings that he found in the wholesale and passed those savings into retail. So what is his uh, Logan? Why pay more, pay less or something, right? Shop mm -hmm. more, pay less, right? That was one of his biggest things because he was able to pass those savings on to his clients. And I do the exact same thing. I'm able to pass on the savings that I get yeah. to the homeowner so that they can get a superior product. And, and, and you know, by doing... By keeping the, the client in mind, we all know that and most of us are in the service industry, whether that's whatever, but happy just isn't enough because happy is forgetful. Making them happier is, is leaving a lasting impression. And as long as you can build on, like, like I said earlier, small improvements every week within your business, small improvements, and then pass those improvements onto your clients, that's how you're going to keep your customers happier that they chose you than somebody else. Um, and while you're doing that, you're going to kind of find yourself looking at different ideas. How can I keep my clients happy? You know, what can I do? So um, you shouldn't care where good ideas come from. Some research from Sam Walton here. If I can interrupt you real quick, Jeff. So something new that we, yeah. we started is that after we've done a project for our client, we offer – a courtesy five year where we go out there once or twice a year and maybe repaint the the roof vents on their home, do some touch up silicone yeah. around some uh, areas of on their roof so that we're continuously doing preventive maintenance on their on their um, on their home, which makes them happier and say, man, you guys got to keep calling this guy. Yeah. And number two, it helps continue to groom that relationship uh, for years to come. Constant contact. Right. Constant contact, staying at the forefront of your customer so that whenever something does happen, the first person they think about is doggone black level is a, a Casey Ashmore and law. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, they absolutely. think about that person. Yeah, I got to do a better job. I mean, I'm communication is key to me, but that, that's something I'm going to take away from today, doing a better job at that. But uh, Matt, I'd like to hear your thoughts on collecting ideas and implementing them in, in your profession, your entrepreneurship, your business. So you shouldn't care where they come from, you know, collect all the good ideas you can and adopt the best ones. So what, what are your thoughts on that? I, I mean, I, I think that's wise and sound advice that I think anybody who is successful in business does, yeah. um, you know, I, I'm trying to think through some examples there, but I think a lot of times what happens is, is in highly competitive industries, you'll always have um, great advice or great ideas that will hit the marketplace. Others will see that and they either in, in you know, emulate it or uh, imitate it because they understand that it's, it's got a, um, that it's got a high success rate. So I don't think where ideas come from matter as much as did they come from someplace in a place of integrity and do they have, do they have the ability to engender trust with your clients because they are enhancing either your product or service. Um, I, you know, 
I think from a from a retail side, I mean, what what Sam Walton did that was highly successful, and the reason he could get lower prices is because he he went into volume, yeah, massive volume, and so he bought in volume, and then eventually he manufactured it, it, it bought products that were manufactured in low cost areas, and then he passed that on that savings on. And I think that idea in and of itself actually fundamentally changed a big part of the American economy because almost all retailers did that. Maybe not so much for the better. Yeah. Because well, you have a lot of manufacturing that was outsourced, but it was the crunching of costs that then enabled him to sell in volume because he was purchasing in volume from, from low cost producers. Well, I, I like how you guys are kind of tying in the same, same concept here. Doc had mentioned how, you know, Sam Walton brought together the simplicity and cost savings, right? And you had just mentioned crunching costs as well. You know, Sam Walton's foundation of how he ran his business was keep it simple. And any of us in the military background, they know keep it simple, stupid. Whether you're a jarhead, an army guy, I don't know if the Coast Guard keeps it simple, but... Um, Obviously not. He's struggling. Yeah, he's over there. Um, but you know, we want to keep. We don't even know what simple means. Yeah, exactly. I mean, those knots you tie. I don't know. I'm lost on those. <laughs> Get you a crayon. You'll be fine, Marine. You know, speaking of though, uh, the the things that you're talking about, you know, and the military for that matter. You know, when we all took the oath, when we all were 18 years old days or weeks or hours or months out of high school we didn't know what the esprit de corps of our individual services meant like doc didn't have any idea what being a member of the united states navy meant but he knew that he wanted to emulate that right and then he wanted to emulate that more when he became a marine corpsman and went to afghanistan and the same for the other two of you who are marines right you had no idea what being a marine meant but you knew you wanted to emulate that. Yeah. You knew, right? The, 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 the Marines didn't make you. You were drawn to that because you aspired to be more. Mm -hmm. And so that, yes, that's a foundation that, that we have as a connection of, as a service related veterans business group. But you know, that also resonates with Patriots, right? You know, the, the Patriots who support our group, you know, they support our group because they want to emulate the same things we do. Right. And a lot, and I, I was listening to a, a book called Good to Great, and it reminded me of something that's important for this. But when, when a, a big steel company was going up against Bethlehem Steel, which was at one time the biggest steel manufacturer in, in the world, they put their mills in places like Lincoln, Nebraska. And the reason why is because you can teach someone how to operate a steel mill. You can't teach somebody how to work. So where do you go find yeah. people who work? Farms, right? Because I'm going to get up and milk the cows before dawn. I'm going to feed all the chickens and I'm going to plow the back 40 by lunch. So that's the kind of thing that emulate, you know, they, they knew that they were going to put that steel mill in a place where people would want to emulate the success that they were going to drive. Anyway, that's my, that's what I got on that. All right. Appreciate that. Good work. So and I wanted to cap on something real quick, Jeff, uh, mm -hmm. imitating and emulating. We all know who Kmart is, right? <laughs> yeah. Blue yeah. Light Special. They tried to imitate what Walmart was doing. Yeah. Where yep. is Kmart today? They're no longer in business. They They're no been. longer in, different, in, in business. And that is the key difference between imitating and emulating success. Because if you become the imitator, you will not last. Yeah, you just. Whereas I would say Target probably emulated. Target yeah. emulated for sure. They created their own brand. They are a little bit more upscale. They have their own target audience, and they, and they understand what they're trying to accomplish with just that slightly better product. Well, they, they took right, what, absolutely right. They took they call what it Target, Walmart was doing. Right? They they took what Walmart was doing it, and they used their own strengths, which is the the key right. kind of definition of emulating something but you know no matter how you emulate the great one whoever that may be that you decide to choose you got to keep it simple like we were, we were getting into so understanding that complex plans are hard to follow um understanding and tracking performance in a 
and, and I'm sure Matt can and can attest to this. You, you deal with performance KP, KPIs and all kinds of stuff in your project management side. You know, they can get real complex. Um, yeah. So, you know, Sam Walton focused on whether his store sold more last year at a lower cost with less inventory, period. That was his focus. So I'll read that again because that, that's in, it's a short sentence, but it's very powerful. Sam Walton focused on whether his store sold more than last year at a lower cost with less inventory. Focusing on a few simple metrics is more likely to keep the business on a stable ground and more successful. Casey, you still there with us? With, okay, he, he's having some uh, technical difficulties. I think he needs- I'm in the chow line, I'm sorry guys. You're in the chow line, oh, I see. Um, Talk a little bit about keeping it simple. You know, with your background, there's not much simple with all the legal documents, laws, things you have to deal with. Give, give us give us some example of how you emulate people that are doing the same things you're doing in your industry, but you're putting your own twist on it to keep it simple. Well, for one thing, the... I think it's incredibly important to bring a tremendous amount of value. <laughs> a tremendous amount of value for free. You know, there's, there's something to be said for providing at so much work that even if the customer was charged 10 times as much, they would feel like it was a bargain. Right. And, and through that, you can you can accomplish that in any number of ways. And I'm not talking about giving away the farm. I'm just talking about going the extra mile. Something that I learned from another farmer right here in Texas, David English's father. Do it now. That is a way you can bring simplicity and a tremendous amount of value to your clients cases. But when you're talking about presenting complex matters to courts of law or courts of appeals, I have found. And, and, and been taught, been instructed by mentors and, and other attorneys who, who helped me become the attorney I am today, that a simple presentation of evidence, 13 exhibits, right? That's what I always, when clients, when I tell them, hey, you got to help me build up the story of you so I can present the best story of you to the judge or to the jury. Well, what do I, I mean, the story of me, you know, then they're like in their universe you know, they're trying to think of their, their Wolverine origin story. I don't need the Wolverine origin story, man. I need 13 good exhibits. Yeah. So think Baker's dozen. I need the 13 best or maybe one of the worst things about you, right? So give me, give me 12 good and one bad. I mean, let's humanize you. But you gotta, it's got to be linear. And the tighter you make it, one of the first judges I ever worked for was Elizabeth Ray in Houston, Texas. And I was making – a robust salary of $6.25 an hour, rolling pennies for gas, nice. working for the Harris County Civil District Clerk. But Judge Ray was a, a wonderful teacher and mentor. She'd been a trial lawyer in Waco. She actually won a bar in a lawsuit. And all the attorneys in Waco hung out at that bar. She had to sell the bar because the Republican Party wouldn't back her in an election in Houston in the 80s because she owned this bar in Waco. So bar goes away. She becomes judge. But she... She taught me, you know, always tighten it, practice that opening, practice that closing, practice that presentation of evidence to where it's shorter, it's better. And something else my dad taught me. And, you know, you're talking about keep it simple. He kept a, you remember the, uh, well, you guys probably don't remember this because I'm a few chapters ahead of you, but the, the big chief Indian tablet that you got yeah. in first grade with the big chubby pencil. That's my what dad, I still write on. My dad kept one of those on his desk his entire life to remind him about simplicity. And he, he rose from, you know, uh, an army intel enlisted man to the head of international sales for IBM in the Pacific Rim. Wow. And he still, he remembered that Indian chief tablet. When you're making deals that big all over the world, you need to make it simple. Because there's a language barrier, there's a culture barrier, and then there's this technology barrier. You know, like, what are you selling? What is this thing that you're selling me that you think is going to solve all my problems? And 
you got to present that in a, in a, and I know that comes in handy uh, in any business because, you know, really what it comes down to is the art of persuasion and the more simple and linear you can make your persuasive speech, whether you're talking about how we're going to upgrade your roof to protect your house, what your audio visual solution is going to be, Matt, you know, what your entrepreneurial or, you know, video, you know, this is how we're going to make your movie better, et cetera. Those are the things that, that, that art of persuasion where it's tight, it's linear and it's clear, concise and precise. Well, that's good input. I, I, I like that. I mean, you know, when, when we talk about emulating other companies, you know, I, I like the analogy that the target emulated Walmart, because if you walk into a target store, it's a very simple store. There's not a lot of colors. There's not a lot of craziness to, you know, you don't have the blue light specials and all these other things like target is just straightforward. Keep it simple. And anytime you're in a business environment, you know, you've heard me say this in past videos, processes, 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 they're key. If you make complex processes within your business, you're going to have a complex time getting your team to buy in on that and hell even understand how those processes work. So even the simplest tasks, can be overthought out, um, you know, and when you're, when you're trying to keep these things simple, you're going to experiment, you're going to, you know, try different things. And, and one thing that you want to do when you're trying to emulate the great per se is you want to experiment with different ways to do that. You know, maybe you get two or three people and you do a little research on them and you figure out who it is. So, you know, doc, tell us about some things that you've experimented and you've tried, you know, within the say the last 12 months, you know, being a multi-business owner, you got to be trying new things all the time to keep them both running good, right? Yeah. So I experienced, experimented with trying to do it all by myself. That didn't work. <laughs> uh, that, that, yeah, that's that right now. Um, but I'm, a, I'm, you guys that people that know me know that I am a, I love to take, take risk. I love to think outside the box. Um, I'm currently right now uh, working with um, another another bed owned company. Um, give them a big shout out, Ben Northcut, All Care Comfort Solutions. Um, just signed a lease over here in Rockwall. And we're experimenting with a whole new concept, a whole new idea of how to give back to the community. Is this shit gonna work? No clue. Do we feel good about it? Absolutely. Do we have a simple plan that we're gonna implement to see if it works? Absolutely. We're not overthinking uh, what we want to accomplish. We know when we want to hit the deadline and we know what we're trying, we're, we know what type of uh, people we want to come into that space. So I'm consistently experimenting with different ideas, different ways that I can train my new hires to make them a better uh, salesman or a project manager. I'm training, um, as you guys know, I know Jeff hates talking about the COVID. It's not his damn thing, but right now I'm, my, one of my businesses is nothing but COVID and I'm experimenting. I have a question about that. What, what? I have a question about that. Okay. Okay. When, when you're done, doc, when you're done. Feel free to you know, see, I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, something I heard, it just sparked a thought. Uh, you know, we have, we have a large homeless population in Dallas County and North Texas. And um, the homeless people can't socially distance, they can't sanitize. You know, they live in tent cities and, and, and they live in shelters. And, you know, like, do we have any data on what's going on with them? I mean, is there like, like massive homeless deaths that are being covered up by the news? I'm, I'm just uh, curious. You know, I'll, I'll be quite frankly, um, I've actually, we are doing testing at a center in South Dallas that offers a lot of help to uh, the homeless population. So I'll be happy to provide you with some of that data. And as we continue to test more of that populace, I'll know more. So again, you talk about experimenting, right? Because we wanna understand who is being mostly affected by this, um, by this outbreak. Is it the people that that are homeless and living on the street is it the ones that are in that that low to middle income tax bracket where who are who is the target um for lack of a better word who is our target who is the coronavirus targeting 
and where is it? Yeah, that 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 percentage of the population that is the most susceptible. Where are what what are they, and how can we help them? Yeah. One interesting point, though, Casey, is that uh, most homeless people are outdoors, and one of the things that they've just determined is actually that the viral load of being indoors and sheltered in place with somebody who may have COVID gives your uh, chance of contracting it a lot higher than if you're yeah. outdoors in open air or in sunlight. So it seems as if one of the issues is that there's a constant, uh, I mean, when you talk about experimentation, we're in a constant learning about what this thing is and how it's responding. Even to the point now where they're saying that it's less type of flu that's more active in how it, how it attacks your capillaries in your lungs. So they originally thought it was like the flu, but now it's actually something that's, that attacks your, your blood vessels. Really? blood type issues. I mean, I think the problem with any of that is that no data as currently that it, there's no really great, strong data that's given a lot of us direction. There's a lot of like noise, but not great signal until we keep going through the process and learning more and more. But I mean, here's what I do know. <laughs> So the, the, the homeless population, I feel that their immunity is a lot better than those that only surround themselves with the same people. We've all heard of the concept herd immunity, right? Yep. The more we around and interact with different forms of people, the greater our bodies build an immune. That's why people joke about, oh, I ate dirt when I was a kid, and that's why I'm, my immune system is so badass. Well, there's a lot of truth behind that. Agreed. Right? So when we right, do right. Uh, bad, our bodies build an autoimmune uh, uh, system against the bad. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at that homeless population and they haven't showered in X amount of days, they're around, they're grimy, they're, they're whatever, they're actually growing their immune system and actually protecting themselves more so than those that are in this sterile environment at any given time because we are weakening our immune system, our, our natural defense to fight off diseases. We have to remember the human race wasn't designed, wasn't always just built and lived inside of homes, right? We started out living in as nomads. And that's why a lot of people survived and um, created such a great uh, immunity against diseases. So there's still tons. I'm sorry of to get us off track. Sorry, Jeff. No, no big deal. But I do want to go back uh, to your original question, Jeff. Um, I'm always experimenting with new and different ideas in order to make the companies that I'm a part of better. Um, as the RVBA, we are experimenting at this point in time with these Zoom meetings and these uh, having our guest speakers on to be able to make us better. And that's why it's so important that we take risks and invite people on there that have gone before us and know more than I do because we're never gonna be able to gain that knowledge without being able to tap into the resources that are at our disposal. And that's why we invited Matt Nalen on here. So he can tell us some of those things that he's, he's experimented with and, and talked about some of the failures that he's had doing some experiments. Matt, what, do you, what is your thought process real quick? I didn't mean to cut you off there, brother. Did you have something? No, go for it. I, well, I was just gonna ask you, what's your, um, what's your thought on adopting uh, being an early adopter of say new technologies or, or new processes, what's your thought process on that? I mean, you deal with some, I mean, you said your company is a, what a billion dollar company. Yeah. Yeah. So what, with that level of a, of a system in place, that company, what's your thought on adopting new technologies and, and, and emulating different technologies to put it in place in your business? So, you know, <laughs> There's frontiersmen and then there's pioneers, yeah. right? And, it, and frontiersmen often get a lot of arrows. Pioneers <laughs> typically come right thereafter. Mm -hmm. And I, I often like to be in the pioneer standpoint. And then you got late adopters who, who fall in place, but they don't get all of the opportunity that the pioneers got. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy frontiersmanship on some things, okay. on some things, right? But when you're, when you're operating a, a very large business, you tend to have – more of a pioneer mentality if you are innovative, or quite frankly, most large businesses are more of uh, settlers or 
you know, the, the gentry that come much later, but because of their size that they've built over a matter of years, they can still be successful because they're this machine, right? They're this, this yeah. machine that's built on sales and accounting and, and, and widespread volume. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of experimenting. I mean, I, I honestly, you got to be decisive and you got to take a risk and you got to determine at some point uh, to adapt because there is no, there's no 100% knowledge of all the variables. Yeah. You just got to take the best assessment that you can with a reasonable amount of risk management decision making and then execute. Yeah, and execute great. against a plan and then adapt. And then as soon as you see that something's going awry, you just, you've got to pivot and or adapt to whatever the, the scenario is that's in front of you. Not to, I mean, it's kind of hard in this situation because I'm not giving tangible examples, which people will fade out. I mean, if you don't give something tangible. So I, I'm trying to think off offhand. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you the oil and gas business is a perfect example. Um, a lot of people probably know it being Texas. It's kind of something that, you know, is culturally significant here, but you had a guy named George Mitchell who, started off as a wildcatter in the 1940s he began the entire experimentation process of horizontal drilling and fracking really oh yeah in the 1940s he did in texas maybe 1950s but what he knew is that directional drilling going straight down into these you know salt mines that were high pressured and that's you know you you, you puncture it and then the pressure from the earth releases the hydrocarbons up in the air you know, he started thinking, well, you've got this, you've got what is essentially this big spongy geology that's in the Permian Basin. And if you can go horizontally and then you add in this fracking, then you, you bust it up. And then it, again, the pressure of the earth squeezes this sponge down and then all the hydrocarbon carbons can come up. And by the way, if you're an engineer, petroleum engineer, and geologist, and I just screwed that all up, you know, hey, that's not <laughs> but, but I think that that's there basically the gist right of it. Now, Matt. I was checking. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know much about it, but it's pretty interesting, man. Yeah, and you, you, you case it, you drill it, and it's become an economic miracle some 30, 40 years later. That's yeah. totally changed, not only th through that experimentation, it's not only changed um, how and why we're able to be successful in the country, but it's been able to change our entire foreign policy. Well, look, we're, we're not beholden to some, you know, Middle Eastern group that already can't stand us. I mean, we, we yeah. became a top producer in this world. And even though we've had COVID and then the hit from the, the demand side, as a result, it's not as if that technology isn't still there and that experimentation, competition demands experimentation. Yeah, I, I, I love that because that's that man that hits home to me because it does. It, and you got to think about we talked about competition a few weeks back and man, you nailed it right on the head right there, Matt. I mean, if if you're not innovating and you're just imitating other businesses in your same industry, dude, you're going to get left behind. Yeah. Well, have you ever seen the quadrant? I think it's a it's a pretty cool quadrant. To so be yeah. highly successful in business, wildly successful in business, it's kind of an interesting quadrant that I had that I, I heard about, and I, I think it's absolutely right. Yeah, sure. One, you gotta be, you gotta be um, they draw it out, and I, I want to make sure that I get this right. But it's you can you could be like everybody else in an industry where it's absolutely cutthroat and then your margins are razor thin, right? Yeah. Or you can be a contrarian, but you got to be right. So meaning you got to be different than everybody else. You've got to be against the grain, but you also have to be right. You can be against the grain and totally wrong and you're a failure. Yeah. Or you could follow everybody else, right? And know that you're right, but because you're not doing something that's, that's different, unique or competitive, You'll never be wildly successful. You'll just grind it out over time. Wow. So when you've got somebody like, you know, and I'm, I mean, that's, that's kind of like where you'll find people who are big time investors. What they look for is they look for that contrarian, that person that's doing something against the grain. I mean, an easy example is, you know, Elon Musk, who said, hey, everybody's got a carbon engine, but, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring back the electric vehicle. Not really. Not, it's not even a totally original idea. I mean, we had electric vehicles even before the the combustion engine. It just it 
it never took rope because there wasn't an infrastructure for it. But he emulated that and he put his own spin on it. I um, knew he could do it. it blew and up. then he did it open source. And why did he do it open source? Because he knew it could grow the infrastructure of electric of electric batteries and everybody would emulate them, which would grow an infrastructure, which could allow him to actually sell more vehicles because now any place you go, they're going to have an electric charging station. Wow, or man. they're going to have a supply chain that's batteries that are being created and manufactured because those manufacturers are going to invest their hard-earned capital in something that's riskier, knowing that there's a bigger market for it. If there was only people who manufactured batteries just for Tesla, why do it? But if you had an open source and you could prove over time that more companies would move that way, he essentially gave away some of his, his electric motor IP because yeah. he needed more competitors because he needed a larger market so that he could then get all of his his suppliers to to create. That's, that's genius. Profile. That's mind blowing to me right now because I never yeah. looked at it that way. But he opened but up. That's the- experimentation. Yeah, that man, you, you hit it on the head with that one. Um, you know, when you're talking about, you know, we're about we got about ten or fifteen minutes left here. Um, Let's talk real quick about finding a mentor or finding someone to emulate. And I'm just going to throw this out there and whoever wants to jump in can jump in, but finding a great leader mentor or someone that you can find traits to follow are certain things you want to look at gestures, how they handle themselves. And if any of these stick out, fellas, jump in on this Uh, speech patterns, you know, their pronunciation, how they speak, their, their pacing, their intonation, um, how they relate to people, their success habits and disciplines, um, even their happiness and general attitude, attitude towards life. You know, Doc turned me on to a guy named Ryan Stuman. If you haven't heard of Ryan Stuman, his name is uh, AKA Hardcore Closer. I, I highly recommend just go listen to some of his podcasts and just pick one or two. You want to talk about getting motivated? Boy, that dude will get you fired up. But the dude came from the bottom and he's worked his way to the top. And I highly suggest, you know, I recommend looking into the guy, at least for some of us young hustlers out there that are really trying to grow our businesses. Um, a few of the things that we just, you know, you know, gestures, you know, Doc, talk about gestures. You and I and Matt and Casey deal with people all day. What does a gesture mean to you when you meet someone and what information does that give you back? Um, gestures plays a, a, a huge role, especially in the sales game, you yeah. know, if you look at me right now, my arms are, cro- are, are crossed and that's going to give somebody um, a couple of different vibes, right? Is he bored? Is he angry? Do I need to hurry up? Is he just tired? Right. Um, and that, and in the, in the sales game, understanding body language, eye contact gestures um, really can cue you in if they're really the right fit for the, that cell right then and there. Right. So if you ever tried knocking doors and being a cold, right, just straight up knocking on somebody's door and saying, hey, let me sell you some shit. Like you better understand body language real quick. And if they're if they open that door and they're happy, go lucky and they're excited to see you, you better capitalize on that in a, in a moment's notice. Yeah. Um, but if you can see that they are barely half ass cracking the door open, well, they're probably not really wanting to talk to you. And you probably want to back away and move on down the road. I've found that when you do that, when you respect somebody's gesture and you understand their body language and you adhere to that body language and you come back the following day or whatever, they're more receptive to you yeah. because you've given them respect without them even knowing it. Right. Because that tells you everything you need to know. Right. You didn't push through you know, their doors barely half open. I didn't put my foot in the door and try opening up their door more. I respected their time and, and that they didn't want to talk to me. But I'll be damned if I didn't go back the following day, they saw the same person and they're like, ah, this guy's not going any way until I talk to him, right? Because yeah. I'm going to keep going until it's no, never means no. It just means not right now. That's it. Um, <laughs> it's $10,000 Thursday, baby. <laughs> yeah, those gestures. That's are- true. That's like, true. You've got to have, uh, you know, in the military we call it situational awareness. Yeah. But you've got to have, you've got to have a keen understanding of what that person is telling you, despite what they're saying. 
And, you know, you'll find that in, in large complex sales as well, right? Because you have to uncover things. I mean, there is a discovery process. You know, you can relate with somebody. I mean, I, I work for somebody who is a, is a master at sales, especially large, complex sales. Uh, and he has uh, taught me quite a bit. But part of it is, you know, relating to somebody. And that's not just relating to somebody who um, you like to hunt, they like to hunt, or I'm a veteran, they're a veteran. That's, that's a superficial relating. You need to understand who they are. Maybe you've come across to somebody on the doorstep and they're analytical. And they're being quiet because every time you're speaking, they're trying to think. Maybe you're actually talking to somebody who's like, somebody who's like bottom line up front, tell me what I need to know. Don't waste my time. Let's get to it. Right. That's going to be somebody who, yeah, but you're going to have to pace and match them. Yeah. Or maybe you're going to find somebody who is more, um, hey, I got to get everybody in my family to decide that this is the right decision for us. Because, you know, they want to put their arms around everybody else and everybody's got to have their input and then they're going to feel good about that decision. But in analytical, if you keep talking while they're trying to process, you're stressing them out. Yeah. A driver, if you, don't, if you don't get to the point and you're droning on and you're getting way into details, they're moving past that sale because you're wasting their time. Yeah, you they just want to know what they want to know. Yeah, and, and somebody who's very empathetic, if you're not... If you're not talking to them about how it's a win-win or how their entire family could benefit, then they're not going to go for that sale either. But you got to make those decisions pretty rapidly. And then there's the discovery process. You know, Doc probably knows this more than anything. I mean, when you're going in there, you have to understand whether or not, or in construction, I've got to uncover what that real need is. Yeah, because what they're saying doesn't necessarily mean what they really want. And you have to be asked assertive, which is asking those questions that drive you to the actual sale. You know, yeah, I like that. Who's your insurer? You know, what is your deductible? Yeah. Right. It's not whether or not they want a new roof. It's there, there may be a, just a condition of like, do I have the money to cover the deductible? Yeah. Understanding so, the pain point. Then you're wasting your time. You're, you're, you're right on the well, Jeff asked a question about, about how to, how to find the right mentor. And I want to speak to that real quick. You know, one, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you need to find a different room. Okay. That, that's, that's one thing. It's, it's great to be the smartest person in the room, but at some point you need to be the dumbest person in the room, the least successful person in the room, the person with the least amount of cold call sales in the room, because you've got to learn, to get better and if you're playing chess with somebody who's worse than you every day you're never going to be the master the other thing is there are so much availability of information because of the blessings of our technological age so zig ziglar is somebody that sales leaders like gary vaynerchuk and grant cardone emulated to become sales leaders of this generation the hardcore closer is a student of sales leaders like Gary Vaynerchuk and Grant Cardone and other, you know, Tim Robbins, all these other, you know, yeah. sales professionals who can really help you. They can mentor you. And, and so you're like, how do you find your mentors? I mean, use your car time as library time, download those audio books, those old Zig Ziglar audio books. There's like 25,000 hours of wow. all kinds of closings. And if you listen to Cardone, Vaynerchuk, Cardcore Closer, Tim Robbins, all those guys, all of them, without exception, Mel Robbins, they all studied Zig Ziglar. So your mentors are out there. You just got to find them. And you got to, you don't need to listen to the ticket on the way into Dallas or in the way into that. that next job, right? I love the ticket. I want to hear about sports all the time. But maybe you ought to use that as library time, right? Fill your mind up with things that are going to better you as a professional, as a persuasive speaker. And, you know, I'm not saying, you know, that it's always got to be, you know, the business. Give yourself that white noise where you're enjoying that, you know, update on the Dallas Cowboys and their latest felony charge, whatever it might be. Um, <laughs> so for you, that's business. <laughs> yeah. That's business. Right. Yes. Yes, exactly. But, but the point is, like, how to find your mentors. Get in a room of people that are better than you. 
challenge yourself, you know? You, okay, yeah, so you're successful at this, but that doesn't mean, you know, my biggest thing that's jacked up with my profession is that it doesn't teach anyone how to run a business. It doesn't really even teach you how to litigate a case. Like, you come out of law school, you know how to do nothing, right? And you either got to go like a doctor work in, you know, residency for a couple of years. So you don't butcher some, but somebody's Liberty property family, but you either get mentoring or you go out and learn it on your own, but you got to find that mentoring somewhere. And we have so much information available to us just in podcasts alone, that that's a way to get yourself in a better room. Anyway, that's out with, uh, I've made some mistakes on, on mentors, right? When I first tried to find a mentor, I found somebody that was in the same industry. That was wrong. Yeah. That was wrong for me. You know what I'm saying? Same here. Uh, same here. They're going to teach me their ways. And I'm not looking right. to be taught their way. I'm looking to be scaled up. I'm looking for that hand up to the next level. And a mentor should also hold you accountable. You know what I mean? I, I, in my opinion, a good mentor should, ch should, should set forth an action plan that says, are you doing X, Y, and Z? And if you are, what did you gain? What didn't you gain? And if you're not gaining, then that mentor is not doing their job. And if you think that you can get a mentor for fucking 20 bucks a month, you're out of your mind. Like yeah. if you want to really take yourself and your mindset to a whole new game, be willing to invest in yourself or spend those hours with your mentor, shadow that person, be with them until they just say, get, get away from me, man, Mike, I can't show you anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that's so I, like I said, and I've gone through what I considered a mentor phase in my life. And I would pick somebody up and tell them, and then I wouldn't follow through because nobody held me accountable because at the end of the day, we're all busy ass people. But if yeah. you're paying somebody good money, that's their job is to hold you accountable and, and, and help you succeed. So we want to study, follow, read, watch videos, use the, use the, the technology that's around us and surround ourselves with mentors and leaders who already have the characteristics you want. I think that's the key right there is what you want. You need to find somebody who has it and start shadowing those, those type of people, whether that's in person, you know, if I go meet with Matt Nalen or, I'm reading a book or I'm listening to a podcast. People adopt the tendencies and behaviors of those around us. As humans, we mimic the people we like and we do it subconsciously. Think about that. You and your circle, your current circle, not just us on this, on this video here, but the people watching or watching after, look at your circles. Look at who you're hanging with and stop for a second and see how much or how many things you have adopted from that circle. The biggest thing there is all of the things that you want to do can be emulated and adopted from the right people. But always remember the key point here is people respect genuine people will read right through the bullshit. If you're pulling it and they're going to call you don't imitate, but emulate and build up the greatness. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today, man. Simplify brother. We appreciate you being on here. Uh, want to got any, any last rounds? Any I'm just see if Matt's got any pearls of wisdom that he's been uh, holding back on us to let us know what what can we do to be better? Oh, man. Listen, I mean, I'm like everybody else. Uh, I'm just kind of rolling through life and trying to get better. Uh, I think one of the things is, is to write things down. I mean, that's that's the one thing. I mean, I think writing is, is a good exercise. You, you know, some people journal, whatever, but you know, like I'll keep a book and when I hear something or when I think of something, I really keep this book for one reason, one reason only because I've got three kids and I, I intend to share with them some of the things that I've captured over my, over my years to, to share with them little, little cheats along the way so that they don't have to hit every hard knock that I have. Yeah. Um, I love that. You know, and I, I capture things and, and I write them down. And I think that's kind of beneficial. That, that's solid, man, because I, as much as I am in the tech era, in the tech 
phase, my company's a tech company, man, I'm a handwriting fool. I mean, you look at my desk and I'm handwriting stuff all, I got a, a daily punch list. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Doc is the same way. We both have our, our war boards that we write down things all the time on. Casey writes down goals every stinking morning or whenever yeah. he does it. I, I, I completely agree with that. And every I day. Think of it as now, now, I, I will if tell I you. I, I, oh, I, I was just going to say, I was thinking of it like this. If I die and they're going through my stuff, at some point, my kids are going to pick this up. And yeah. my goal would be is if they pick this up and they look through what dad wrote down, that there's going to be some lasting impact of it. Absolutely. There's, there's the things that I, I keep love here that are my days, but then there's the things that I think, now I've kind of got this part figured out and I want you to know this yeah. and I want you to understand it. And there's That's things awesome. in here where it's going to be, it's going to be fully, fully transparent. You know, it's the hard realities of life. Shit, Matt, you make me want to go down and write down everything I did for the past 10 years. So I have 900 and I have 909 notes on my phone. And I do the, I do the, I do a very similar thing. Yeah. I do it on my phone. I use the notes on my phone. Yeah. And, you know, it, it doesn't matter how you, because, you know, there's going to be those moments where you have an epiphany, right? And I think that's an appropriate word because it's, it's a word that means, you know, like an awakening. And when you have that, you, you need to record that because the, the next thing you know, you're going to be drinking water out of a fire hose. You're going to have 10 roofs to do. You're going to have all these customers who have fires you got to put out. You're going to forget, right? So recording it somewhere. I don't care where it is. You know, I write my goals down every morning when I get up, sometime between 4 and 5.30 in the morning. I write down every morning all my goals. And then sometimes I, I write them down again just to make sure I'm reinforcing it. But those little epiphanies that you have, you listen to something, you had a conversation with doc, you had a conversation with, you know, somebody else that, that you encountered in your work day. And you're like, this is a way that I can continue to go from good to great, writing it down. Because if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. Well, that's what they say, man. And you know, all we're trying to do here is be better men today than we were yesterday. And by surrounding yourself with the right people, you put yourself in the right place on the right bus. You emulate and put your own spin on some of the successful people that are out there. You're bound to be successful. But if you're imitating somebody else and you're just trying to, you know, pull some shit out of a hat, then you're bound to fail. I'll give you a prime example. Somebody emailed me today and forgot to put a character in my email address and send it to some knucklehead that has blacklevelav at gmail.com. Somebody took my damn email address. How weird is that? So by all means, though, try to imitate me because it, it is what it is. I'm not worried about it. But emulate the people that are great. Stand in the right room with the right people, man, and, and surround yourself with fellas like these guys right here. You know, the Rockwell Veterans Business Alliance, we're here to help you out. Every one of us is, is – is, um, you can reach out to us at any given time through via Facebook Messenger. Most of you guys have our phone numbers and emails and things like that. But – we're going to wrap this up. Matt, thanks again, brother, for showing up, man. I appreciate you taking the time. Doc, Casey. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you guys. And uh, I'll close with just letting you guys know that the Rockwell Veterans Business yeah. Alliance is a veteran and patriot uh, business organization. So while our numbers are increasing for membership, we're about a 50-50 split now, which uh, those of us that are veterans and those of us that are patriots, and we accept all of them. So if you're interested in being a member, or hell, even want to get involved and put some uh, boots on deck with the Rockwell Veterans Business Alliance, reach out to us. We'd love to have you help out. Um, any last rounds? We're good. You guys enjoy your evening. Let's uh, for closing. All right, gentlemen. Y'all have a good night. Peace okay, out. Thanks. Sorry about the technical difficulties. We're going to square you away. Don't worry about that. We're going to get you squared away, Casey. I promise you that. All right, boys. Have a good night, fellas. Thank you.